ahead and get started though. Um, we're so excited to see all of you here tonight and uh, you are in for a treat. Um, Bob and Lucy have presented two times prior at our meetings and they do an amazing job and you just don't ever want them to stop. It's like you just uh, cannot hear enough and see enough. So we're really looking forward to that tonight. And, um, but we're gonna, uh, before we get started, um, Jim reminded me, um, we put these around, our, uh, these are our membership brochures. And you might not be ready tonight to sign up or anything, but take it with you if you want. It tells you when our meetings are, gives you a little more information about us, and then of course you can become a member. Becoming a member doesn't mean you really have to do anything, uh, but you will get a, a newsletter. And those newsletters are spread around tonight too. And if you've got a seat that doesn't have a newsletter, there's some extra ones up here. Um, because we were gonna announce some exciting things in that newsletter today. But you would get a monthly newsletter and uh, we'd just be thrilled to have you support the uh, Historic Society. But uh, we do try to plan uh, me monthly meetings that are of general interest uh, to the community. Sometimes they're history, and of course, the Duncans are going to focus on the birds tonight, but talking about history, and we're going to have them come back at some point and talk about the history. Their, their family history could probably goes back further than any family uh, at, at all. The Duncan family, uh, they were the, one of the original settlers in the Gulf Breeze Peninsula. So um, we will save that for another time. But, um, but at any rate, tonight, if anybody does become a member, um, we have a uh, we have homemade cookies here tonight. There's a basket that has just individual cookies in there on the table. There's some water there. So if you're starving or need a snack or just some sugar, um, and there's water. But um, if anybody becomes a member tonight, uh, right before we, when we finish the program, before we start the business part, I have a little container of cookies that we're going to have a drawing for. So we'll, 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 pick, we'll pick from the new members and somebody will go home with some extra cookies. But uh, my name is Barbara Udit and I'm the president of the Historic Society and we're so glad to have you here tonight. And um, if you'll bow with me, we're going to go ahead and open it with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful, beautiful day that you've given us today. And we thank you for this wonderful building and the city that we live in. We are so blessed and we thank you. Uh, and we, we just appreciate being able to meet here tonight and uh, get to learn about uh, your creation. And uh, just uh, bless our time together and bless everyone who's here and even those that couldn't be here because of different uh, situations uh, going on in their lives. And uh, we love you so much and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. And now I'm going to ask Mike Novak. Is that correct? Uh, if you'll all stand, we're going to um, we're going to just do the Pledge of Allegiance, and Mike's going to just lead us off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. And now I'm going to ask Jim Cox, our vice president, to come up, and he is going to introduce our speakers for this evening. I am absolutely delighted to introduce Bob and Lucy, uh, they're the, 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 the Duncans, and just Barb mentioned they're descended from the very first settlers on our peninsula in 1870. As a matter of fact, the Duncan Family Cemetery is right next to the church. It's right out on Fairpoint Drive across the street from the First Baptist Church. And they live just a, a, a little bit down the road from there. Okay, And if you want to hear an amazing statistic about birds, okay, on their piece of property, just with their feet planted on their piece of property, which is on the north side of Fairpoint, so it's on the uh, Pensacola Bay, okay? Over the years, they have documented 303 species of birds. Wow. That never blows my mind, yeah. you know? It just, it blows my mind. But uh, their, their knowledge about birds, you know, it goes back many, many years. They've been very, very active in the Audubon Society for a long 
long time, and I am uh, delighted to introduce my neighbors, Bob and Lucy. Seven years of living in the same place, our place is a migrant trap. A migrant trap is some place where the birds need refuge when they've taken a battering over the Gulf of Mexico, coming in from South America and Central America. They hit bad weather. First place they put down there, and Gulf Breeze in general. But I'm not going to get into the, into the history here. Um, I'll tell you a story that uh, connects. The Duncan uh, homesteads very, very remotely with uh, the um, Chicago Field Museum, the Prince of Bird Collectors, and Teddy Roosevelt. How does the Duncan F uh, F estates relate to that? Well, when I was doing research for our book, The Birds of Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Opelousa Counties, which Lucy will show you, and we have over there, uh, this was printed in, in 2018, I came across an interesting bit of information on the species that counts for Backman's Warbler. Backman's Warbler is now extinct. But let's go back to 1897 first. 1897, what was it like here? My people were here. Fairpoint Drive was a sand road. It was the old military road, and it ran all the way down. Well, I know it ran from Live Oak all the way down to the point. There were three houses there in 1897 in Gold Freeze, nobody else. One was the first house built, and that was on Hoffman's Bayou, and it was called the Lake House where the Duncans um, first lived, and by the way, it was a freshwater lake, and they tried to raise goats, and the alligators would get the goats. <laughs> so um, anyway, that was the first house. Second house was down on a point, almost at the end of the point, and what is now uh, uh, Peaks Point. And, that, and the third house was uh, on the bay, just across from the way about the Baptist Church is today. And it was occupied my, by my great uncle Dallas, who was a sturgeon fisherman. And if I recall, the last time we were here, we, we I told you all about the mystery ship and the coffin. But I'm not going to go into that tonight. I'm just going to tantalize you. Anyway. Um, that so one's on YouTube. That one's on YouTube last time. Is it in the here. book? Is that in the book? Okay. Um, anyway. Anyway, and, and going across the species accounts of the Backwoods Warhol, I came across the fact that a fellow named George K. Cherry, who was the actually called the Prince of Collectors for the various museums in the United States, the British Museum, the Rothschilds, American Museum of Natural History. He was on Town Point, which Gulf Breeze in the first um, post office was 30 years into the future. The Duncan's were literally once there. And uh, George Terry collected three Backman's Warblers on Duncan property, and he probably stayed with them. I'm not sure about that part. I never heard that story from my people, but I just happened to come across this in a species account. So anyway, why is George Terry famous as well, besides collecting birds? Um, fast forward 16 years, to 1913, and he had all this experience in South America. He was really the Indiana Jones of uh, bird collectors. He got his arm almost shot off, shot off in Peru, wound up in a Peruvian jail, almost died. He ran arms for rebels in Venezuela, and um, so he had all this experience in, in uh, Candino, Candido Rondon, the great Brazilian explorer uh, asked Teddy Roosevelt if he would like to go with him to find the source of the river of doubt in 1913, and Roosevelt, of course, accepted. And uh, he asked George Terry to come along, and George Terry was actually 
instrumental in saving this almost ill-fated expedition. So that's the connection. Now we'll uh, talk about birds. The picture behind you, <laughs> the man on the left is Kermit Roosevelt. The man in the middle in the white shirt is uh, Candido Rondon. And on the right, you see Teddy Roosevelt. And this, this happened not long after Roosevelt had lost his attempt to come back and be president again. And um, they had to beat their way up and down the waterway. They had to portage their very heavy boats that they brought. They brought a lot of equipment that was ill-fitted for jungle and so forth. But nonetheless, they had their tea in the morning. And at any rate, um, so that's, that's part of the connection. And uh, Cherry was part of this expedition and is credited with having saved the expedition as well as the bill. But in 1897, he was here in Town Point. Okay. Birds? So we're going to start with the birds here. Okay. If I talk too long, I'm going to So, okay. Um, we're going to start out here. And we're going to talk a little bit about spring migration because we're almost here with spring migration starting. And we wonder, my God, is when does spring migration start? You know, um, we are here on the central Gulf Coast, northern Gulf Coast. And here is where many of the birds land when they take off from Point South. And so we're going to answer a few of these questions for you. Why do the birds migrate? When do they start moving in the spring? What routes do they follow? And why is Gulf Reef important for migrants? Now, Bob already touched on that last one because this is the first land mass that they come to if they're coming into um, the 87th parallel, which is where we are. And uh, we're, you've got four pickings over there, sparsely, uh, with sparse trees and such. And then we've got this area of Gulf Reef and back then, in fact, even when I moved to Gulf Reef in 66, when Bob and I were married, um, Gulf Reef did not have as many of the huge live oaks that we've got and so forth. There were more pines, but of course, pines are brittle and they break in storms. Um, but you stop and think, everybody puts in uh, lines to water their yards, their trees and everything else. And so a lot of the vegetation took off. Now down on the point where we live, uh, not on the tip of the point. The vegetation, well, across from us, it was just white sand with Florida rosemary, uh, turkey oaks, and uh, a few scrub pines, um, and of course the live oaks that we have. And so the birds coming across, they say, this is where we can rest, be safe, and eat uh, all that we need. So we're gonna go on and see what we can find out about birds migrating. So why do they migrate? Like any reasonable piece of fauna, they're gonna migrate to where they get the things that they need, to get the food that they need and have places to reproduce and have their nest. And so they're gonna move from areas of low or decreasing uh, resources and they're gonna move into higher areas, areas of higher resources. And so that's the primary reason that birds are going to be moving. And so they're looking for food and nesting locations. What kind of nesting locations, I mean, what kind of insects, anything that they can get in their beak, they're going to eat with a few exceptions. They're looking for budding plants. They're looking for um, berries and so forth, like this, this beautiful beauty berry here that is wild all over Gulf Reef. A lot of people have them in their yards. The birds absolutely love those berries in the fall. If you don't have beauty berries, oh, by the way, they sell it for, they call it fridge mulberry, and they up the price. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, but I got some of those. They so do grow I. <laughs> all over the place, and it's beautiful, and uh, they love that. But okay, so they, by migrating northward, they get, um, in the springtime, they'll have longer days, so they can have several broods, and then they um, get less crowding because they can spread out here, and then there's less competition, and so there's less wasted energy. 
right now in our yard we have um, a little warbler, a yellow rump warbler, that is fighting everything that comes, every bird that comes around. He wants to own all the feeders, including the hummingbird feeder, but he's trying to take command of that. Okay, so when should we see the first migrants? Do you think it's April? No, March, no. The first migrants, January. We've already had our first migrants here. Does anybody know what it was? Geese. Uh, Joshua? Uh, I've got it. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, the first migrant. How about a purple mark? Oh, what about it? Okay, it's going to die now. Say okay. purple martin. You're going to see the purple martins. They're already, a few of them are already in. They're already inland more. I've seen, I haven't seen any here in Gulf Breeze yet, but they have been noted east of us here, up, up, up the peninsula a little bit. So at any rate, you'll see the purple martins coming. So at any rate, we're going to look. Uh, the, the scouts arrive first, and the scouts are the males that are ready to breed. And so they're coming first in order to move into the best habitat that they can find. And so whoever gets here first gets the best territory, but it comes with a risk. A late front, or snow, whatever else. And you know, they may bum out. This guy is really tired, his feet is wet, he's tired, he's flown all the way across the Gulf of Mexico. They winter down in the Amazon Valley. They work their way up to the northern tier of North America, of South America. And then when the time is right, they take off 550 miles in one straight shot. It's pretty amazing. At any rate, they, uh, they get on up here. The last two weeks of April are the really best two weeks for migrants here, uh, where we are. And uh, so the last two weeks of April, you'll find a lot of bird watchers and pickings down around our place and so forth. So at any rate, um, that's when it is. We're going to look now and see what comes in in February. Does anybody know this bird? It's a warbler. This is a Perula warbler. If you live somewhere else, you might call it a Parula warbler. It's tomato, tomato, Parula, Perula, whatever. This bird actually breeds here in Gulf Breeze. It breeds in those festoons and Spanish moss. And uh, it builds a nest in the um, Talandria. And um, you will probably hear it if you're around oak trees with moss. It has an ascending trill. There's a beautiful little trill that goes. Oh, my right. that's the only one of those trees in Right. <laughs> so, at any rate, um, so we've got Northern Perula. It, it winters down in Central America. It winters um, a little bit farther than that into the northern tier of South America. The earliest date is February 18th, so we are all coming up to it. But I just read today, I think it was maybe yesterday, I just read that somebody over on St. George Island, east of here in the App Appalachicola, has already found Seen them first. So they, they beat us to it at any rate. Anyway, in March, oops, wait a minute, what I got here? There we go. In March, we can start looking for hummingbirds. Right now, if you have hummingbirds, they're probably wintering hummingbirds. And uh, in the winter, we're not going to talk about the hummingbirds, but in the winter, we have some species that are really western species. But come March, you'll start seeing the, the hummingbirds. And interestingly, the hummingbirds manage to come about the time our native plants are starting to bloom. And did you know that hummingbirds, of course, they drink the nectar for energy from sugar, but they eat a huge amount of insects, too. If you find a beautiful day and the hummingbirds are in in late spring, and if you look at the sky around the edge, of, look at the top of these oak trees with the sky behind it clear, you'll see a lot of little tiny, tiny insects flying around up there. Of course, you got to have binoculars, I think, to do that. And you'll see the hummingbirds flying out from the tree and nailing bugs right and left. And of course, why do they want to do that when they can come to my hummingbird feeder? Protein. 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 They gotta have that protein. Okay, so other birds for March. The Louisiana water thrush, this is one of the 
few more recent walks. He has a really cool little walk he sits along like this and bobs his tail up and down. And uh, this bird breeds in the river swamps and uh, he arrives early because he knows that the weather will be agreeable to him. He hopes so. And um, the male and female look pretty much alike. He spends the winter in Central America mostly. And then we also get in March the Prothometary Warbler. This breeds in the river swamps. This is a beautiful warbler. It's one of the larger warblers that we have. Look at that honker on your face. <laughs> got a big bill there for a warbler. <clears throat> and uh, if you've got a water feature in your yard, even if it's an upside down garbage can lid filled with water, <clears throat> you're gonna find birds coming to it particularly in the springtime or in dry spells, and they'll come into your bird bath and so forth. Another bird that comes in March will be a prairie warbler. And I told you a minute ago about the Peruvian warbler, how it has this trill that goes This guy goes up the scale too, but he steps on every step. He goes And he stops at every step. These don't breed here, but they breed and cut over areas of if you go up county and you find um, farmland that's been cut over and they've got scrubby uh, pine trees that are like 10 years or less and maybe this high or less, <clears throat> that's where you'll find these guys in the summertime. <clears throat> Prairie warblers breed in uh, the great, I mean, they winter in the greater Antilles and um, they stay on the coast pretty much as well. You find them in Yucatan quite a lot. You might also think while I'm talking about this, why do some birds arrive early and some of them arrive later on? Well, it has to do with where they're going to breed because those that are going to breed in Minnesota or Michigan or New Hampshire, they don't want to get up there in March or April, do they? Because they just won't have the insects. They won't have what they need in order to breed and raise the brood that they want to raise. Another bird from uh, March is the uh, black and white warbler. This is a favorite warbler of a lot of beginning bird watchers because you can remember its name. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this bird winters extensively throughout Central America and in the West Indies and Northern South America, and it's a wonderful little bird. <clears throat> in April, we're leaving March and we're going to April, uh, here's another water thrush that, remember the other water thrush? He walks and bobs along like this, looks just like that practically. This guy's got streaks on the throat and the other one doesn't. He arrives later. Why? Because he's going farther north. That's so at any rate, the northern water thrush, he, he uh, spends a lot of time in the winter in Mexico, the West Indies, and in South America as well. And then we get some of the big birds that you all like to see at your bird feeders the rose-breasted grosbeak. <clears throat> the male is on the right and the female is on the left. And um, look at that bill. It is a seed-crushing bill. And um, if you look at birds and you're not really familiar with bird watching and so forth, look at the bill first. It's just got a long, skinny bill. Just a minute. It's got a long, skinny bill. It's not going to be crushing heavy seeds. Yeah. I might add that everyone she's shown here passes through Gulf Breeze. Well, that's what it is. I thought it was <laughs> really. Yeah. So at any rate, um, some years back, I was banding birds for Fish and Wildlife Service, and I would catch these in the mist nets, and I would handle them very, very carefully, particularly after I was grasped by one of those beaks, and uh, you know that you've been bit. <laughs> It's not intentional to hurt, but it, it got them out of my hand pretty quickly. Okay, so in April we get summer tanagers, the male and female summer tanagers. This tanager breeds northward from the north end of our county upwards. And if you're up in the north end of the county, uh, if you own property up there, you can probably hear that bird. It has a two note call, like that. It's not real musical, but um, at any rate, they do breed up there, and it's one of the specialties that you get to see. If you go up the Blackwater River uh, area, you'll see those. This bird spends the winter all the way down in southern Bolivia. So he's come even farther to get on up here. And of course, these are just a few of the birds that come through here, but then 
here are a few more. And I think a lot of you have probably seen some of these birds, um, particularly the blue one there on the bottom. I think there's a pointer on this, isn't there? Yes, there's a pointer. Okay, the indigo bunting. There have been a few of us already seen this spring, and they do breed here in this county, in Santa Rosa County. And um, this bird right here, the painted bunting, does not breed right here, but breeds a little farther north, more on the Georgia coast and northward. Um, here's an indigo bunting again over here. Um, you have uh, Swainson's thrush that comes through, yellow warblers, orchard orioles. You see the uh, roast bee, prothonotary, and uh, another oriole over here. At any rate, these are just a small sample of the birds that come through here. And um, I will put in a plug right now for the local Audubon chapter. We do field trips, we do bird walks, and you're welcome to come along. Look up the Audubon chapter online. We have a website, it's F as in fruit, M as in mother, Weston, W-E-S-T-O-N dot org, fmweston dot org. And um, all our activities and all the work we get into is on there for you. Okay, this is an interesting story here, I think. Some birds from May. Here we've got two cuckoos. Whoops, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let's back that up. There we go. The yellow-billed cuckoo, black-billed cuckoo, and the bobolink. The bobolink breeds far to the north of here. He winters way south, all the way down to Argentina. So he's come a very long way. And there's a little problem with them because they flock in the wintertime and when they're down in South America and they go into the fields and they'll eat the grain and the people hate them and so they kill them. Oh. And so these are their birds. They spend more time in South America than they do up here, but there are birds too. An interesting thing on the cuckoo, yellow-billed cuckoo right here on the right, it breeds in the river swamps here. It comes from northern South America and eastern southern part of Central America the, uh, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. He breeds, I mean, he winters much farther south than this one, the black-billed cuckoo. The black-billed cuckoo winters in the northern part of South America. This guy winters farther south, but this guy comes in early, even though he has much farther to go, because the autumn's able to figure it out. Where do you think the black-billed cuckoo breeds? That migration is really fascinating and people didn't always know what the heck happened all the time. Where did the birds go? And back, long back before the time of Jesus Christ, about 400 years before I might say, Aristotle said he thought that the birds hibernated. They just tucked away somewhere and hibernated, okay? And that was a thought that people had for a long time. And then, in the 16th century, a great uh, cartographer who knew his maps and knew North and South America and everything else. So do you think that he would get an idea that's where they would go? No. He said, they don't leave. They just gang up and they all at once go down to the bottom of the rivers, down into the clay at the bottom of rivers, and that's where they hibernate. And then they come out in the spring. <laughs> I don't know how many people he knew, but at any rate, that's actually published from way back then. Then in the 17th century, we had an English minister named Charles Morton, and he came along and he said he knew where they went in the wintertime. He said, they go to the moon. <laughs> and he said, sailors at sea have actually seen birds fly down and land on their ships. They're coming to the moon, of course. <laughs> Not like. But at any rate, later in the 17th century, a man named Francis Willoughby set us down on the path to avian truth. And so he wrote that he thought that the birds actually migrated, but there was no proof of it. 
And so there was no proof for years and years and years until, well, that's what I was talking about. He wondered why they went, oh, tell them. Until in 1822, in Germany, a stork flying in from South America, or from, I'm from Africa, I'm sorry, arrived and he had an arrow through his neck. The arrow was examined, it was hardwood from down in Central Africa. Wow. So that was the first actual proof that they had that birds came and went from foreign travel. Mm. This bird is mounted and is in a museum in Germany, in case you want to go, okay? But anyway, meanwhile, a lot of people were still arguing about birds and where they migrated to and from. And it, it involved several very famous ornithologists. One of them said, oh no, they cannot possibly fly across the Gulf of Mexico. And I was like, are you kidding me? Of course they do. Why would they take the long way around? So they had quite a discussion going for a number of years. And um, then along, one of the two men was a fellow named George Williams. He was a professor at Rice University in Texas. And he said, there's no way that they can fly across the Gulf. They're coming, you know, they've got to come up through Mexico, through Central America and Mexico and come on around. And of course, when the birds get here to the northern Gulf Coast, when they come up, they don't go over to stay here. They spread out, of course. So at any rate, George Williams said, no, they um, definitely have to come by land. There's no way these birds could come any other way. But then I'm going to have a little interlude here. Our Audubon chapter is named the Francis M. Weston Audubon chapter. And the man, Francis M. Weston, moved here in 1916, 1916. And he was already a birder at the time. And he had been taught by some ornithologists up on the East Coast. And they said, hey, nobody ever kept records from down there. You need to keep records. Well, he was working at the Naval Air Station, which is a great place to bird if you can get on with the air station. And he founded a group of birders, and it's called the Francis M. Weston Society of Natural History. And he became a mentor for a bunch of Boy Scouts. He became their, their teacher for the bird study merit badge. And he had in his group of people, he had a man named George Lowry and another person was Charles Kahn. How many of you know the Kahns here in Gulf Breeze? You knew Charles and Betty Kahn, both of them had passed away, and then their son, Charles Jr., I guess, he lives here in Gulf Breeze now. At any rate, um, Charles Kahn was, um, Charles Kahn was um, one of the Boy Scouts. And so when Bob and I started birding in the late 60s, about 1967, we met all these people, and they took us all around and showed us where to go and where to look, and so they were wonderful mentors to us. But at any rate, George Lowry said, these birds, he was, remember he was one of the Boy Scouts, he grew up and he went to college at LSU and became a very well-known ornithologist, and he said, none of these birds are flying across the Gulf, I'm gonna have to prove it. So he used his graduate students, indentured servants, at any rate, he used his graduate students and got them lying out on the beaches at night under the full moon, training their binoculars on the moon to see birds flying across the face of the moon. How many parents believed that when the kids said that's what they believed? I don't know. <laughs> Having had two sons, I would have been skeptical. At any rate, um, so he... George Lowry was able to confirm that these birds actually take off from points south and they work their way across. Some of them come up through uh, the Lesser Antilles, the Greater Antilles and so forth. Others will come on up through Central America to Yucatan and then they'll take off from there. And so his contribution was to show that there is actual proof of these birds coming in that way. Um, 
one of his students was a fellow named Sid Gotlo. And Sid uh, is a professor emeritus right now at Clemson. And he took it a bit farther. And he started doing radar studies with an X-Lab radar and so forth. And do you know, you can look at X-Lab radar on your computers right now. When there are migrants coming through, you can tell that those are birds coming through. Sometimes you can tell, oh, it's a big cloud of insects. But you can tell the difference if you have practiced it a good bit. But anyway, so <clears throat> we talked a little bit, I spoke of the route. There are three main routes that bring the birds up here to the northern Gulf Coast in spring. The routes are determined by where the birds spent the winter. So if they spent the winter down at the northeastern corner of South America, they're not going to come up the west way. They're going to come on up through the Antilles. And of course, um, they are also influenced very strongly by weather and especially by wind direction. <clears throat> and I will mention this, that long before the radar studies came out, Bob had figured that out. He has studied weather since he was 15 years old. He took uh, meteorology classes at Tulane when he was growing up. And for most of the early years of our marriage, and probably until 15 years ago, every day there would be weather records. He's got boxes of those things. <laughs> anyway, weather records that he would predict. And he finally, as a birder, he finally saw the connection between when the birds were arriving and the weather situation and what was putting the birds down. We know the birds are coming over, but what's going to make them sit down here where we can see them and so forth. So here we go. Here's some of the routes that the birds take. They like to take off from Yucatan. Now the very top end of, northern end of Yucatan is not very uh, woodsy or anything like that. It's very flat and uh, the main vegetation that you have is on the coast where you've got lots and lots of mangroves. But anyway, they come up from the Yucatan Peninsula. They um, come on up straight up to Pensacola and points between. And you see how the first trajectory goes up to Galveston? That's the 95th par parallel. We're at 87.1. Uh, 87 and so at any rate, most of these birds are going to hit this area in here and uh, or the area in the middle. And then others will come up through the Antilles and the Great Antilles. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. While others, I've got a headache from. Others will do just exactly what the early ornithologist said, come up through Mexico, through the Texas coast. And of course, the Texas coast in migration is fantastic. So <clears throat> we know that those are going to come on up. So what is going to, why do the birds suddenly decide to move? We think that the tropics are full of plants and bugs and all that other stuff. But they start reacting to the length of the day. The days are lengthening. They have hormones that start bubbling to the surface and they get quite restless. But even though they're restless, the weather triggers when they're going to come. So when do they take off and how high do they fly? That gets a little technical. We don't need to go into that. But the weather is what is the determining factor as to where they are going to land. Are they going to land over on the Texas coast? Are they going to land over by Tampa? Think about the weather system. And so the birds are going to go with the flow. Even though they take off on, let's say, they take off on a tra trajectory that is to the north, northwest, say. But if the wind is out of the southwest, it's going to just like a sailboat and yaw them all over here. And so they don't ever take off thinking, oh, I'm going to Pensacola, I'm going to Tampa. They don't have that in their mind. But um, too bad. <laughs> At any rate, they go with the flow. Here's a little weather lesson here. You've probably heard on the weather reports about the Bermuda High. Okay, the Bermuda High is a high weather system that parks itself over Bermuda here. Now, high weather systems have of clockwise rotation. So that high system has clockwise rotation bringing up these south winds out of the south. And that's exactly what the birds want, okay? So 
the last two weeks in April, I mentioned, are gonna be your very best week for birding in spring migration. And you think you go out on a day and you say, oh, this is a perfect day for the birds to be migrating and there are no birds, why? Okay, go look at the weather down here in South America, Central America, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's a wild to figure that one out because long before we had computers and the weather channel and all the other information we had about the weather, we say, oh, we've got fallout conditions, rain in the go, perfect for birds. Let's get out of the Fort Pickens. And I tell them, my fellow birds, hey, let's go, they're going to be here. They get out there, nothing. Oh, we didn't know what was going on down here. We didn't have satellite data back in those days. And you can see if you're a bird and you're from northern Venezuela or, uh, or the Dominican Republic and you've got water all day, you're not going to want to fly. Nothing happens. And they're not going to fly into adverse winds either. Uh, they're smart. So at any rate, if you were wanting to know, you know, you would look at your satellite images and see, was it good enough for them to take off? Okay. Now, when they get up here to the northern Gulf Coast, Bermuda Hunt is still over here. It's still trying to bring winds around in a clockwise rotation. But up here, you've got a low weather system here that's coming in from the northwest, okay? When that <coughs> happens, that is going to be a counterclockwise rotation. So when the two weather systems meet, you're gonna have a conflict there, and so you're gonna have some sort of rain there. And the dotted area is rain, and this is what we would call a shallow squall line. So it would be a small squall. It would extend just a little bit off the coast, not too much. And birds who are coming across and hit that, they will put down briefly. They'll put down nests very briefly, and then they'll take off again. But this is what birders love to see. And this is just a system that extends, oh, silly. <laughs> extends well out into the Gulf, and birds coming into a weather system like that, they're tired. They've used up more than half of their body weight for the energy to get here. They get wet, which means they're heavy. And passerines, which are your songbirds, they don't have the oil glands that the waterbirds do have, that most of the waterbirds have, to keep the feathers dry. So when they get to the coast, they put down and they're exhausted. And so that's what brings what we call fallout, when a whole lot of birds come down into an area in a short period of time. And we hope, when we're birding, we hope to have a fallout. This is one of my favorite artists, Charlie Hoffman, you may be familiar with him. <laughs> and if you don't have a major fallout, then all it takes is one great bird. And this is what happened. <laughs> there you go, Joshua. This is what happened in 2017. This bird was found at Shoreline Park. This is a tropical species that should not be here at all. We had between 350 and 400 birders come from the eastern United States. We had a fellow come from Canada. We even had a Russian who came to down and stayed in the gazebo at um, Shoreline Park just to see this bird. And the bird accommodated everybody. Thank you. The assistant, uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, bless his heart, he came three times before he ever got to see it. Well, you know. Uh, the bird was on schedule. They had a schedule. It was arriving around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So Lucy and I would go out and meet our new birder. And sure enough, the bird usually appeared. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one person here in the audience here, Joshua, back there in the corner, waved to us. Joshua. Joshua had just started birding at that time, and he saw this bird out there and didn't have a clue what it was, I think. And uh, so at any rate, but I want to talk to you very briefly, and I'll make this short because we're at the end of this. Think about the influx of 250 to 800 birds from out of town. They stayed in our motel, they ate in our restaurant, they bought all the food, they shopped in our stores. This is a huge economic impact. So it behooves us, it behooves us to take care of our natural resources like shoreline parks. We need to keep that wooded and beautiful. These wonderful trails and the boardwalks is just fantastic. And
Colin Hart is calling the New York Hart Theater in Long Beach, Florida. And it's probably the greatest treasure to be had. And uh, so at any rate, it's a wonderful economic boom for the area for the fabulous bird of summer. Our book, which is, which you see up there, is a booklet. We published this one, this is the third edition. We published it in 2018. There are no pretty bird pictures except on the cover and on the back. But instead, what it has, it tells you some history, some of which we talked about here. It tells you about all the birds, every bird that has been documented since 1916 in our area, in the Boone County area, the westernmost three counties. It, it tells you when they're here and when you can find them. Sometimes it even tells you where you can find them. It tells you about fallout. And then if you see this bird and say, gee, should it be here or not? You can flip to the back and look at the bar chart and find out if they do it for you. We do have some of these. They're fifteen dollars for fifty dollars entries. But anyway, thank you all so much for not going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And uh, anybody answer any questions? Yeah, if you want to ask questions, okay. It was suggested to me that there was an increase in birds of prey in the Have you found that? There is the, the increase basically is the cooper tar. It's an excipitor. It's a, a bird of a forested area, wooded area, and um, it eats other birds. That's its favorite thing. It also eats squirrels. And so at any rate, you will sometimes mm -hmm. find that bird swooping in over your backyard fence, whoosh, right over your bird feeder, and suddenly there's a missing dove from your feeder, your favorite breed of, of big dogs, you know. So at any rate, um, what's the name of it? A Cooper's Hawk. Cooper's Hawk. And um, the Cooper's Hawk is um, a nice size exhibitor. And uh, we also have a few other um, raptors in the area, but the Cooper's does breed here in Gulf Breeze. The first Gulf Breeze nest of Cooper's was found in our family cemetery, which is across from the Baptist Church. And uh, so at any rate, I'm sure there are more of them. I might add that uh, eagles are fairly new to breeding here. We have a pair of breeding right now in Shoreline. But when I was a kid, there was an eagle nest mm -hmm. in Shoreline Park. Uh, we had excess when they were old cow fast. Um, but they have come back, and this is a recent addition. Also, I want to point out that if you have a feeding station and you don't see any birds, you don't say, well, birds are down in population on their left and this and the other. If there's a cooper talk in your neighborhood, don't count on birds. <laughs> they're going on the cover, they're not coming around the cooper. They're on the cover someplace. And that, that's why it's so important for you to have in your yard shrubbery, preferably native shrubs, that where the birds can hide. If you've got a feeder that's out in the middle of nowhere and you've got nothing but lawn around it, the bird is very vulnerable there. And speaking of native shrubs, plants. I've got some handouts over there on the table with a list of native tree and other herbaceous plants that are really good for this area. They're native to this area. And the handout tells you how many caterpillars, how many species of caterpillars depend on one tree versus on a crepe myrtle, you know? If you're going to plant something, think about planting something that's native. Um, there's a lot of information out there on native plants. Any other questions? Checklist from Shoreline Park without rails. 
We you read know, your checklist. Yeah, see, we're gonna, we're if you're not going to see them, we're going to have to hear them. Gotcha. You didn't I, I, I didn't even know they were there, so I didn't know what to look for. Yeah. But anyway, good to way, know. I'm not definitely going to be keeping the uh, ear out for those now. <laughs> by the way, happy birthday, Joshua. Thank you. Oh, happy birthday. So at any rate, uh, you, you got questions. I'm just seeing a lot of grabbing. You know, they didn't come this year. Well, I saw about five on my property, uh -huh. but um, you know, I'm, I work wood and cloth, so just, um, mm -hmm. they were getting a lot of worms, because I know that seems to be one thing they like. Well, we're, this time of year, we're used to oh, yeah, no, a whole lot of robins, a whole lot of cedar waxwings. Those birds did not come down this year like they usually do. Usually by the end of November, we're covered up with, with these northern seeds come in in flocks. Why? The weather up north has been wonderful. They had no reason to leave. And if they don't leave, then they are supposed to wait on a breeze. So if I move, if you can stay on good territory. You know, uh, I talked to an acquaintance of mine who lives not too far from Detroit. I talked to her about two and a half weeks ago. She said, we haven't even had snow. Can you imagine? Anyway, any other questions? How to take down all my bird feeders because of the bears. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any suggestions? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what we did because we had mm -hmm. bears come into our yard. Yeah. And they took galvanized pipes that were two and a half inches of throwing diamonds and bent them over yep. like a soda straw. They pulled down the feeders that were hanging from trees and so forth. Yep. My younger son and his wife got a bunch of ropes and they climbed up the oak tree and they did a trapezoid of lines through the trees, and then we had our feeders hanging from those lines too high. Now, we watched one of the biggest bears in the yard, and I watched him reach for the feeder, and he was reaching as high as he could, as high as he could, and he missed it by that much. When I reached up, I missed the feeder by that much. So they can reach up about that high, a little mm -hmm. more than that. And so that's what we did. But so hang them high out of hang them high. reach, not on a post right. on the ground. But if okay. you have raccoons, they oh. are so yep. smart. We'll, we'll see raccoons go out on a limb and, and pull the rope up <laughs> <laughs> until, they, until they get to the sewage. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, think about it. You can do it. Anyway. How do you fill the feeders then? Well, there's a line that we attached to an oak tree down low. We throw the line over the high thing with enough leeway that we can undo it from oh, the oak tree and lower it, like fill the feeder. It's not a pulley, it's just going over the top row. Oh, okay. And then pull wow. it back up when we're done. You know, so. <laughs> Thank you. When I grew up here, there were never any pelicans. When I came back in like the late 90s, 2000s, there were pelicans. Isn't that DDT related? Absolutely, absolutely. In about 1970, we had been birding for two years, two and a half years. We got a phone call. A woman who lived out in Lillian had gone into Joe Caddy's to buy some fish or something like that. She saw an immature pelican. She called us and said, spread the word. And I called Charlie Kahn. I called the <coughs> at work. And then, then we called the people in Fort Walton, and they called the people in Panama City, and Panama City, and we converged on Joe Caddy's to see this one pelican. What year was this? This was about 1970-ish. Okay. 71, something like that. And the reason was the DDT that was being used made the eggshell so fragile that when the adult bird sat on it, the egg would break. That happened to eagles, it happened to peregrine falcons, it happened to all of the apex predators, and um, it happened to pelicans. And DDT is a pesticide, basically. Oh, yes, yeah. it is. And the pesticides that we use now do not necessarily thin eggs, but they do other things mm -hmm. that are just not good for you. You wonder, I can't help but wonder, there are things that are going on health-wise that didn't happen 50 years ago. Right. Why? You know? Falcon asks good questions. We don't use pesticides, we don't use herbicides, we don't use fertilizers in our yards except for a potting plant. I'll put some fertilizer on it. <clears throat> because 
whatever I put out in the yard is going to ultimately percolate into our water aquifer. And I don't want to drink that. So then, any other questions? Can you please give a round of applause? There's more at home, so if you don't get a book and you want one, maybe put a little note by your name in the sign-in book, and then we'll get we'll, we'll try to get a book for you. Um, and be sure.